Today I'll be making Gordon Ramsay's famous beef wellington while blindfolded. Let me be clear, this is not a challenge. I would never challenge Gordon. He's had over 20 Michelin stars across his lifetime with restaurants all over the world. And I think we all know how intense he is. I mean, we've all seen the idiot sandwich meme and I think we're all still looking for the lamb sauce. Where's the lamb sauce? He really did also teach me quite a lot of MasterChef and I know he looks intense, but the reality is that he's one of the sweetest guys you'll ever meet. So Gordon, if you're watching this, it's not a challenge. Here's the deal. I, along with many others, think of Beef Wellington as one of the hardest dishes in the world to master. Beef Wellington has always been a home cook's worst nightmare. And just by looking at it, you could understand why. You've got that beautiful golden brown crust on the outside, a bunch of layers in between, and then somehow a perfectly cooked piece of meat in the middle. Most people can't even properly cook a piece of meat by itself, let alone inside a Beef Wellington. So it really comes down to this. I just want to see if I can put on this blindfold and make the perfect Beef Wellington. By the way, before I actually get started, I'm about to toss on a blindfold and might cut off all my fingers today. So don't forget to toss a like on the video. Let's get started. To begin, we need to make sure that you cannot see through this blindfold. And that requires this very delicate rolling process. But first, I'm gonna have Manny verify that he can't see anything through this. Put it on, man. All right. It's a little kinky, Nick. Everything is dark and I can't see shit. Okay, so to begin, we need to take our Chateaubriand, which is essentially a large cut that you get a bunch of filet mignons from. The biggest thing I'm worried about today is cutting my finger. Because when I'm doing something with my knife, normally I can tell how far away from my finger I am. Whereas today, if I'm pinching the plastic bag over here and here with the knife, I have no idea what that distance is between the two. And that's scary. To start, what we have here is American Wagyu. Japanese Wagyu would be far too tender and would literally begin to melt in our Wellington. Now that we've got our Chateaubriand laid out neatly on the board, the key and one of the harder parts of today is going to be me figuring out exactly what portion we want to use for our Wellington. Already, I can tell you that this end piece is going to be much too small. Not only will this not look good, but this will overcook in the Wellington. We need a nice even piece somewhere from the middle here. Where's my knife? Is this the top side of the box? <laughs> <laughs> Just by feeling with my hand, I can tell that right here in this area is when we start to get more of an even piece of meat. So I'm gonna make a nice clean cut right here. This piece you can reserve off to the side. We don't need this for today. Now I should have a much more even log-like piece, but this is still too big for a Wellington. We need to be able to fit that puff pastry around it and wrap down the edges. I also wanna trim off some of this excess fat. And I can tell it's fat because it's a lot harder and feels quite a lot different from the beef. We have the same situation where this end tapers off a bit. So again, I'm gonna cut with my knife right here. And hopefully that should leave us with a nice perfect piece in the middle. Again, Again, it's good to trim off some of that excess fat and silver skin, but ultimately this is a perfect piece to start with. As I finish trimming off some of the silver skin off this piece of meat, I'm then gonna do one last final trim just to really get that perfect Wellington shape. If you're eating something as luxurious as a beef Wellington, you don't want a bunch of hard, tough, and gritty silver skin on there. So it's important to try to trim as much of this off as possible. By no means does this feel like a perfect Chateaubriand cut, but this will work for our Wellington. For now, I'll set this aside. What are you laughing about? <laughs> And it's time to move on to what's called a duck cell. Oh, what did I spill? I spilled a soda onto a bunch of cables and we don't want to get electrocuted, so we were having a safety stop. Imagine the headlines. YouTube chef tries to make blindfolded beef wellington comma electrocute himself. Our duck cell is made up of three different ingredients. Shallots, garlic, and assorted mushrooms. Which side is sharp? This side. To begin, we'll chop up our mushrooms. At this point, once I've chopped it about as fine as I can really get, I wanna go ahead and feel to see what we're working with here. If there are still any large chunks in there, I may just run them between my fingers to try to get those a little bit smaller. Cause to be totally honest with you, there are so many mushrooms here that it's hard for me to tell what's going on. But ultimately, I'll be cooking the moisture out of these mushrooms, so they're gonna get mushy anyway. For now, I'm gonna set these aside. Where am I setting them, Any? Literally on the countertop. Perfect. Once those mushrooms are set aside, it's time to chop up our shallots. For those that don't know, shallots are basically a different type of onion. And you often see them in fancier cooking. To chop my shallot here, I really just want to peel off that outer layer of skin and dice them up finely like our mushrooms. Once these are nice and fine, I'm going to go ahead and give them a nice rough chop. Again, just to try to get them similar to my mushrooms. You know, the one great thing about chopping onions with a blindfold on is that you don't cry. I might start cutting my onions this way from now on. Once we've finally chopped up all of our shallots, I'll move these off to the side and then it's time to chop up that garlic. Manny, where's the garlic? Did you take the garlic? No. Me. Me the garlic. I'll crunch that garlic down, then take a single clove and my knife and push to separate it. I absolutely don't want any of that garlic skin in here, as that would be just as bad as leaving a bunch of silver skin on the beef. It's tough and you can't chew it. You can put as much or as little garlic in this as you want, but I'm just gonna do about two or three cloves. Now, I'll mince the garlic into a similar size that those shallots are, perhaps just a bit smaller. Once all that garlic is nice and chopped up, frankly, I'm not even gonna try to mince it, we're then ready to take our mushrooms, shallots, and garlic and make our ducks out. Where's the end? Keep feeling around, there you go. I still got it. Good job. <laughs> Perfect. 
I'll go into my pan with just a little bit of olive oil. I have no idea how much that was. My garlic, was that garlic or onions? Shallots, anytime we add garlic in, we need to add salt. So, which type of salt did I grab? Uh, you got truffle, black truffle. Perfect. I'll go with just a little bit of black truffle salt. Ah and begin to stir things around. We don't really want to put much color on this. The goal is to get out that moisture. So I'll turn my heat down just a little bit and then begin adding in those mushrooms. Now the goal is to get this into as much of a paste as possible. We're letting all the water in the mushrooms, the shallots, the garlic, basically just boil off. But to do that, we need to continue stirring and make sure that nothing sits in the same place for too long or it'll burn. I'll probably be doing this for about the next 10 minutes. Once our duck salad is a fine, slightly more dried out paste, I'll set it all aside in a bowl to let it continue to cool off. If you place it uncovered in the fridge, it'll dry out even more. Now it's finally time to start cooking our beef. But of course, we need salt and pepper. Help me where? Give okay. me some. A little bit to the right. Okay, a little bit to the right. Okay, that's the, the pepper right there. Grab it with your right hand, and then salt's next to it. Grab Felt it. it. Left. Yep. Thank okay, you, sir. Left. At this point, it's time to salt and pepper. This is where the benefit of having electric salt and pepper mills comes in. To all of you watching, if you ever, ever plan on making beef Wellington while blindfolded, forge a little bit. Get yourself some electric salt and pepper grinders. We want to make sure that every last nook and cranny is covered with both salt and pepper. Really, don't worry too much about over seasoning, so long as you're not giving this thing a pepper explosion. Once this has been seasoned, I'll place this right beside me and go to grab my pan. Ah, ah, ow, ow. To start the cooking process for our meat, start with a neutral cooking oil that's not gonna burn when you heat it to a high temperature. We'll go in with our beef and I just want you to listen to that sizzle. We wanna let this go for about a minute and a half to two minutes on each side. The idea is not to actually cook the beef right now, but is instead to get a nice char and crust around every single side of it. Once we've gotten a nice crust on the first side, I'll flip it over and continue on another side. Again, the timing on every single side should be the exact same all throughout this piece of meat. Now again, we flip one more time. To finish this off, I wanna get a nice crust on the ends as well, just really for about 15 seconds on each side. And then our entire piece of beef will have a nice crust on it. It probably won't surprise you to know that I got this from the Wagyu shop, like I do with all my Wagyu. For some reason, when I make Wellington, I like to give it one last roll all the way throughout to make sure I really did hit every last nook and cranny, and then we can set it aside. Now, because I don't want to end the day with third degree burns, Manny's gonna help me get rid of this pan here. You got it? I got it. And then immediately, we want to paint our entire, damn it. We want to paint our entire piece of meat with Dijon mustard. But please do it while it's nice and hot so that it really soaks all of that mustard in. Some of the parts of this video and process are easier than I thought they would be, but some of them are way harder. And I'm somehow at the point now where I'm feeling extraordinarily dizzy. So at this point, we'll let it rest for just a minute or two while we prepare the other ingredients for finally rolling up that Wellington. Don't okay. do anything. Okay, okay, okay. Walk three steps forward. Turn. No, 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 no. Take. Now reach out with your right hand, a little bit to the right, pull it back. Wow. Actually, Manny, while we stop, I have to go to the bathroom too. You gotta keep the blindfold on though, that's the rules. I, I can help though, I'm down. <laughs> To begin the layering process, we'll start with our crepes. I've done this every time I've made Beef Wellington, and it keeps it so that all that moisture doesn't leak out and make your puff pastry soggy, because no one likes a soggy puff pastry. To begin, I'll layer down four pieces of our crepe, but the real key here is gonna make sure that this is nice and evenly rolled. Next up is our prosciutto. Again, this is one of those ingredients in Wellington that I'm not entirely sure why they put it in there, and when I say they, I don't even know who that is, but I guess in this case, it's Gordon Ramsay. And I'm not gonna argue with Gordon Ramsay. So next, I'll add my prosciutto, once again making sure to line it up as best I can. But now that I feel like this is nice and lined up, it's finally time to go on with my duck cell, okay. which we want spread out in a very nice thin layer across everything. Our duck cell should be as thin and even a layer as we can possibly get. I know it might have looked like a lot of mushrooms at the start, but in this case, mushrooms cook down the same way spinach cooks down. You feel like you got a lot of it, and then suddenly, there's nothing. If you're unsure of how wide to spread this out, go ahead and reference that piece of beef. If the mushrooms and prosciutto and crepes are just a little bit wider than your piece of meat, you're good to go. Now, once I have a nice even layer of my duck cell, place down your meat. And I gotta wash my hands again. Okay, let's do it. Okay. All right, keep going, keep going. One of the steps that I'm most nervous for with no vision, we very tightly roll it up. The idea here is to press it as hard as possible. Making sure that plastic wrap is extremely tight around the Wellington. Once it's mostly rolled up, I'll fold it up the rest of the way, bring it back towards me, and roll up those sides. In my humble opinion, this step right here is the most important step to making a proper looking beef Wellington. At this point, into the fridge we go for about 15 to 20 minutes. After 20 minutes in the fridge, it has come time to unwrap our Welly, but you wanna be very careful with 
this process. Again, the whole point here is to keep this as tight as we can possibly keep it. So once this has been unwrapped enough, I'll leave it off to the side so that we can use this plastic wrap to layer it on top of the puff pastry when we're ready. Now for our puff pastry. It's a pretty cliche thing among chefs to say that you're just gonna buy this pre-made and that's what most people do. If you wanna make your own puff pastry, all power to you. Now first, we wanna hit it with just a little bit of flour sprinkled right over the top just so that our rolling pin doesn't stick. That's my knife. Now we wanna begin rolling this out just a little bit since right out of the box, the puff pastry is a little bit thick. Just to be safe, I'm gonna open up this second sheet of puff pastry just so I've got plenty of puff pastry to work with. Where's my roller? Damn it. Okay, thank you. Now once that puff pastry is rolled out, before we do anything, we do need to get some egg wash, which is just a few egg yolks with a touch of water, and lightly paint it over the inside of our puff pastry. We'll be painting both the inside and the outside with egg wash. For some reason, I'm starting to get a really bad headache with this blindfold on, and it also just feels very disorienting. Once I've made sure I've painted enough with egg wash, I can finally bring over the big old filling. I'll take my fingers on the outside and measure perfectly to the center, and that right there is where I want to drop down my welly. Now, very gently, I'll roll it right on onto the base of the puff pastry, pulling away that plastic wrap. And now for the moment we've all been waiting for, keeping it very tight once again, I'll roll it up. I'll press my fingers to seal off those edges of the puff pastry, and then very carefully with my knife, I'll carve all the way around, peeling that excess puff pastry away. Again, this should be very nice and clean, so make sure to tuck in any of those ugly edges. As for the corners, you can pretty much fold these up however you like, then once again, trim off that excess and pinch it all together to seal. I'll do the same process on the other side. Finally, I'll slide my Wellington off to the side, bring back my tray, and carefully lift my delicate beef Wellington onto the center of my tray. I know it probably looks like a giant burrito at this point, and that's kind of the point. Once again, I'll go over the entire outside of my Wellington with egg wash, making sure to cover every last bit if you want that nice golden brown finish on the crust. And then I've got a choice to make. Do I take my knife and make some nice patterns across the Wellington, or do I just toss it straight in the oven? Manny, what's your vote? Straight in the oven. Okay. <laughs> I thought you believed in me. And the very last step before it goes in the oven, hit it with just a little bit of flaky salt. We finally made it to the baking process and we're now gonna bake this at 400 Fahrenheit until we have a beautiful golden brown exterior. We can't mess this part up, Manny. We got this, okay, forward. You can't help me on this one. Okay. This is all me. I hear the oven, I feel the oven. In we go. I can't see a thing. Is that okay? Center? Good. Obviously I can't look at the Wellington to see if it's golden brown, though Manny might have given me a hint or two. But fortunately I'm convinced that smell is my strongest of my five senses. <laughs> On we go with our glove and to the oven we go. What are you laughing about? I nail the handle every time though. Manny, I want you to react how the Wellington is. If it's bad, say it's bad. I smell burning. Holy oh. Is it bad? No, it looks really good. It looks amazing. <laughs> really? You're perfect. You're Feels perfect. unbalanced. You're good. Find the table. Here we go. Ah! I mean, it's not the prettiest Wellington I've ever seen, but there's a full on rip in my Wellington. That's sloppy work right there. I'm gonna have to say, maybe you could have left it in for 10 more seconds, 15 more seconds. This color is fantastic. Just listen to this. That's a welly. And now I want to measure perfectly into the center of my Wellington, which appears to be right about here. And then very, very confidently, we slice in. And now the moment of truth. I can't see it. Say something, Manny. Say something. It's amazing. It's amazing. I'm, I'm speechless. Can I peek? I'm speechless. You're speechless? I'm speechless. You're fired. Wow. Yeah. It's warm in the center. It's often hard to tell on camera how well something is cooked or whether it's done, whether it's not done. The only way to really know is by the feel. Because for all you know, I could just edit the color of this to make it look perfect. But the center of the Wellington is nice and perfectly warm. And as you can see all the way around, it's cooked perfectly even all the way throughout. I think at this point, it's fair that I say goodbye to the blindfold. I've completed the task at hand. I also have a splitting, raging headache. And don't plan on doing a blindfold video like this for quite some time. The mark of a truly good beef Wellington is this. A perfect, beautiful gold brown puff pastry on the outside, a nice medium rare meat on the inside, and perfect even layers of your duck cell and prosciutto on the outside. After doing this entire day in a blindfold, in what was probably the toughest challenge in my kitchen yet, I can very proudly say that this right here is the perfect beef wellington. Let's give it a taste. Now for the most exciting part of the day, the fact that we get to actually eat this beef wellington. I don't like to make you wait, so here we go. I have something very simple to say about that. It does not taste like it was made someone with their eyes closed. But you know what? This beef wellington really makes me think. It makes me think about the fact that even though this doesn't look bad, good food doesn't have to be pretty. In fact, more recently, I've honestly come to the realization that I would so much rather go to some hole in the wall restaurant and enjoy a cheap, not fancy meal, one that cost me no more than 15 or $20, than go to some fancy high-end restaurant and taste what they have to offer. That's not to say that both experiences don't have a time and a place, but this wellington right here is really good food and I made it without seeing anything for the 
the entire several hour process. Gordon, if you're still watching, or if you even clicked on this in the first place, I want to remind you once again that this was not a challenge. You will always be the culinary king in my heart, and I appreciate you for giving me this Wellington recipe. To everybody else watching, don't forget to toss a like on the video and make sure to subscribe, because I'm pretty sure this idea came from one of you, and I'm always down for a crazy idea in the kitchen. Happy cooking.